Well, thank you all for coming. Um, for the last evening session today, I'm here to talk about ownership types. Uh, what are they, and maybe even why should you care? Uh, we'll see how we go. Or another possible topic for this talk would be structured programming with objects. Um, I should apologize as I get going. First of all, I'm sure I'm going to miss people out that I would like to talk about. And some of the slides will be dodgy because I just finished them in the back of the room right now. And I don't recommend it. It's sort of probably breaking your wrist just before you have to go into the talk at conference. <laughs> Aliasing is endemic in object oriented programming. I wanted to say that because I knew it would get a grip from this in the front row. Alias is endemic in object oriented programming. The whole idea, or well, one of the important ideas in object oriented programming, is objects have identity. <coughs> And people like Beth von Meyer have talked about the principle of uniform reference, which means given an object identity, you can refer to that object from essentially anywhere. You can refer to that object from essentially anywhere. Um, Niklaus Veer put this in a different way. Programs are, sorry, pointers are the go-tos of data structures. And if you track down his book uh, called, funnily enough, Programs Equals Algorithms and Data Structures, or the Oberon version, there's this table. Um, actually, that, I'm going to have to scan a better version of that, um, <laughs> which I believe I scanned from a copy of this book, uh, a paper copy that was in the <coughs> library in Duckstall. And you know, atomic elements is apparently a assignment, and enumeration is like a compound statement. And we've got repetition as a for statement, and down the bottom, a general graph. The general graph of programs is go to's, and the general graph of the data structures is essentially pointers. What's the problem here? Well, the problem is aliasing, in the sense that you don't know where your pointer is going to go. It's the problem with uh, if your code is written completely with go-tos, especially like pointers, and those go-tos uh, weren't actually just a constant line numbers, but were computed or random or stored in variables and who knows what else. Who would know where your program was going? A particular problem seems to arise when we get structures like this. So here, I think this is just uh, supposed to represent the implementation of a vector. So this object A up here represents the vector, and it's got a reference to the object for the size, it's got a reference to the array of the contents, and, you know, we've got, I guess, three elements that are, that are sitting in this array inside the vector. And um, I'm showing two aliases. An alias here is when uh, there's some pointer, more than one pointer to a particular object. So uh, down here, for example, this element K, which in some sense is inside the collection. What does it mean to be inside the collection? Well, for now at least, let's say maybe if you print out the collection, uh, if this object changes, then the value you get when you print out the collection will change. There's some sort of dependency here. Uh, problem is that, well, maybe in, in some ways this, this kind of doesn't seem to matter. If you think about it, it's like, well, we should be able to have an object that's in more than one collection. That, that doesn't seem something wrong, especially if we're doing object-oriented programming. You know, we should be able to have um, a list of students in the courses that they're enrolled in, and we should be able to have a list of students that are graduating uh, this year, and you know, a student should be able to be enrolled in more than one course and also on the graduation list. That doesn't seem to be too much to ask. Okay, but what about this? I mean, here we've got a reference going straight into the contents of this array, and who knows what kind of things that can do. It could remove objects, it could replace them, it could effectively change the size of the structure by deleting half the elements. And it's doing it without reference to this object, which presumably is, in some sense, maintaining the invariance of, of our collection. And in fact, the more you think about it, the more this kind of problem, and particularly these references here, particularly this one, a reference into the implementation of something like this, or in some cases, even a reference into, into a student like this causes real problems. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. The first one is memory safety. If you want to delete the collection, how do you know when to stop deleting objects? Do you delete the, um, you know, sure we want to delete the array, but do we go down and delete the stuff that's in the array or not? How do we make that decision? If things aren't aliased, it's really easy. You just say, well, the array is, so everything is here, it's stored in the array, we just delete the whole lot and we're done. But once we have these kind of aliases, what happens if we want to synchronize things? Uh, maybe that was a Java vector, and so the top level uh, object is synchronized, which is fine, for some definition of fine. We all know we shouldn't use those kind of things. But if we're 
relying on the synchronization of that top vector object A, and something is coming screaming down into the side here, then we've got all kinds of potential for race conditions. If an alias is exposed, you're going around the synchronization control you have. What happens if you want to move this collection from one machine to another? How do we decide where to stop? Part of the answer is, well, careful programming. It's like, yep, yep, great. great. How do you decide where to stop? You're building a transport infrastructure. How do you decide where to stop? Well, maybe we don't really want to send it to another machine, but we'd like to store it on the disk, which in some ways is, is actually the same problem. How do we decide where to stop storing this? Do we store everything that is in every array? So if we're storing these lists of students in classes, every single student gets stored every single time they're in, another, in the same class. And if we then want to recover this, do we suddenly go from having 100 students enrolled in four classes to 400 students, each of them enrolled in one class, Funnily enough, there are four copies of the students all have the same name. Security. If we're relying, in some sense, controlling the access to the top object here, well, if we've got something coming in the side, how do we know they're not going around whatever kind of security codes we have? Or more prosaically, again, if we just want to clone an object, most object-oriented languages have a clone operation, well, how do you know when to stop? If you're writing the clone on that operation in the vector, you do have a choice to make. <laughs> you can clone, you can do a shallow clone and only clone the vector itself. You can do a deep clone and uh, clone all the elements. And you know, this choice is so obvious that most libraries support a separate shallow clone and a deep clone method, and then say, well, basically, you're the programmer, you should know what you're doing, it's all up to you. How can you do it? How do you know if you get it right? If we're interested in verifying stuff, these aliases call all kinds of problems to build that are quite how much of the object is actually invariant? If we think we've got some collection or even some much more complicated object, we've got an invariant controlling that, how can we be sure the invariant is maintained if possibly the same thread, so some alias and some other part of control we didn't really think about, or even worse, another thread or another process can come in at the side um, and completely ignoring any of the careful controls we might have put in to maintain that alias. Um, want to update user interface, it might be really interesting to be able to say, okay, well, when does this abstract object change? When is the value different? Well, again, if we're pretty sure that the only way this vector can change is by something calling the operation, we know what to do. We can use an observer, it can, or we can use a reactive framework, and the vector can signal a change, signal a change whenever it changes, and off it goes into our reactive system. Except if people can come around the side, then suddenly, make changes to these kind of things that will never be detected. Oh, those are the problems. Or some of them. Basically, it's, you know, it's almost like aspects. This is a list, basically, of everything I can think of, and then just say, A is things a problem. Well, we know it's a problem, and we've known it's a problem for, what, 25 years, more or less? At least. Well, longer if you go back to Dahl. Um, we'll go back to, to Viet, sorry. Um, and so, in 1991, at Oxford, there was a meeting uh, to deal with this problem, and several people, at least one of whom I think <coughs> we are saw, saw is here, um, came up with this notion of the Geneva Convention on the Treatment of Object Aliasing. And the idea here was they had at least recognized that this was a problem, and then they came up with, with four <coughs> strategies that people could use to deal with them. Uh, you could advertise that there was a possibility of aliases, you could hope that there weren't aliases and detect when they happened. You could prevent aliases from happening. And I've now forgotten the fourth one. But you can find this on Google. And, and, and sorry, advertisement, that's right. The fourth one was you could actually do something, instead of just relying on some passive detection, you could have some way of something when it's getting alias tells the world, oh, by the way, I've got alias. Prevention, detection, advertisement, and... Um, As well as this, there were programming guidelines to try and avoid this. So you may have come across the law of Demeter. No, someone's nodding, that's right. Someone's nodding, someone read something that's more than 10 years old. Um, the law of Demeter is not a majority design law that says don't talk to strangers. Okay. It says, well, within a method, you can talk to the parameter of the method, including self. Wait a minute. Um, any, any object capability people in the house? Yeah, right, well, could you arrange to lynch Carl Lieber here at your, at your convenience? Um, object capability peoples really would not like this pragmatic reason in here. 
global object which could practically mean anything. Um, or an immediate part of it. And by immediate, it means, well, something that is my part. If I am that vector and I have an array inside me, I'm allowed to talk to that array, which is an immediate part. If I am something standing back further in an object that's using the vector, I'm allowed to talk to the vector because it's my immediate part, but I'm not, by this law, allowed to go through the vector, around the side, and alias the array that is inside the vector because it's not my immediate part, it's the vector's immediate part. An object returned from a vector called myself, an element of the collection which is going to be the self, an object created within the method. Okay. So here's a programming guideline. Um, more recently, William Cook uh, summed up this, which said an object can only access other objects through there, that is, the other object's public interface. It seems to make sense if we've got a vector, well, we really don't want. You know, which has got a public interface, that's what we write to, that's what we're relying on, being able to reconfigure our programs. We're programming to the interface, not to the implementation. Well, you know, he goes on to say, any programming model that allows inspection of the representation of more than one abstraction at a time is not object-oriented. Okay. Which is a pretty strong statement if you think about it, given that we just started by saying, alias is endemic, we have object identity, the whole point of object-oriented programming is that you know you can point to stuff and you can keep pointing at them. So one way to think about this is that there's this tension in our programs between abstraction and encapsulation. Okay? Um, we build an abstraction, even something as simple as a vector, and we might have one object, a vector class, that we're writing to actually <laughs> implement that abstraction, but it is going to use other objects in the implementation of that abstraction. And what object orientation says is, well, look, those things are encapsulated. They're encapsulated because they're in private fields, for example. And that's the level of protection which most programming languages traditionally work out this idea of a protection of names. So there might be a field called contents in this vector, and that field is private, and that can only be accessed by the particular vector where that field belongs. But what all this discussion says is that doesn't help if by error or by mistake or by general sneakiness, um, nothing that says this field can't be written says nobody else can somehow get a reference to that field. Okay? In the simplest case, I can give away the world, maybe for an optimization reason, I want to make something go fast in the vector, so I just have a, you know, hand out my instance variable, hand out that field in order that someone else can iterate through me well, they can do a hell of a lot more than this read through me real quickly. So this is where, um, uh, good grief, 20 years ago, uh, myself and various other people, notably Jan Vitek and John Potter. Um, John has now happily retired and Jan is completely frantic, came up with this idea of flexible alias protection. And flexible alias protection was a language mechanism that we didn't really know what, how to implement at the time, and we didn't really know what we wanted, certainly not when we started. But we said, look, what we want to do is we want to protect uh, the objects in our program against these kind of problems. Uh, that's where we started from. And so we said, what do we want? Well, no representation exposure. And in fact, this is something that's been around at the very least since, since Barbara Liskov uh, started talking about the difference between representation and, and probably before that. If I am an object and it's, I have some object that is part of my representation, then it should be encapsulated in myself as well as part of my abstraction. It shouldn't be exposed to the outside world. Okay. Um, know what I call argument dependence. Okay. You shouldn't be able to screw objects up by sticking something in, such as, for example, uh, putting some object in as a key of a hash table. And then later on, maybe that object is a student, and later on that student uh, changes their gender identification from male to indeterminate, and gee, we just happen to be hashing on the gender identification. At which point, not only are we never going to be able to find that student again, but depending on how we programmed up the hash table, chances are we may have blown up a whole lot of other searches that happen to find that one and then carry on or not carry on as the case may be. They'll get there, they'll, they'll notice something's off, they'll stop. We didn't want these things to be able to be changed by depending on things that's not in the representation. 
and then something I call no role confusion, um, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, and so what we wanted was something like this. In this case, we've got a hash table, uh, and it's got two arrays. And again, we've got students in these arrays, and we've got marks in these arrays. And in some sense, this here is the main abstraction that I care about, the hash table abstraction. Uh, and the primary thing we want to prevent is a representation exposure. We don't, you know, we can have pointers obviously going outwards, and we can have pointers coming into these students. Okay, and you know, we have lots of pointers coming into the students. Uh, we can have lots of pointers coming into the hash table, and in fact, those not shown on this diagram, which is in fact the diagram from the talk I gave 20 years ago at YouTube in Brussels uh, with severe food poisoning. Be very careful about the muscles of eating Brussels. <laughs> um, you could have multiple pointers in this array. Instead of an array, this could be a lovely doubly linked list where you've got pointers all over the place, or some kind of B tree where you've got multiple pointers into individual things. In <coughs> but what we can't have is pointers. No incoming references. I've talked about argument dependence. Again, you know, maybe here's that these students are the keys if we're hashing on their gender identity, or perhaps more prosaically, if we're hashing on their student number, we shouldn't be able to break this by a student numbers changing, but the student object remaining the same. And by role confusion, what I mean is you shouldn't be able to feed something in here as a student and get it out as a mark, or vice versa. Why? Well, it's because it's not just enough to say here's a hash table. We want to be able to use that hash table as part of a program. So here's a diagram of a bit more of a program. And we've got a course object. And the course object has this hash table in it. And the hash table has got the course marks. Okay. So it's kind of important <coughs> that a course object can depend that if it, say, asks the hash table for some student, well, either put something in the hash table as a student, and then asks for a student out. It's only ever going to get out the things it put in that it said were students. Okay. Um, there's no way that a bug in here can accidentally leak. Because you know, I mean, people might be able to ask. There might be a social network. People might be able to ask, okay, tell me all the students that you are enrolled in the course. And you don't want some kind of bug in the hash table when you ask that, suddenly hand back a whole lot of mark objects instead of a whole lot of students. How did we go about that? Well, like this. Uh, again, this is from 98. It's all pretty horrible. Um, we have a class hash, ta hash table, which has got uh, hackle brackets and parameters. And you can see, you know, we haven't yet caught the Java bug. Uh, for better or for worse, we're still living in C++ land. And we said private, okay, that's the standard name protection you find in C++. Or if you're a Java programmer, you can imagine uh, the private keywords repeated there. But the important thing is we're saying rep. What we mean by rep is not just the name keys is private, but we mean we do not want this array that we've stuck in here to be accessible outside the abstraction represented by the hash table. And the same thing here for the items. Okay? Uh, and we've said val integer, and val means, well, you know, as long as it's a value, that's fine. Because um, you can share values, you can share immutable things that aren't going to change. So this is saying, well, like, maybe it's an obvious, but obvious that it has to be, but we, we want to put one of these on everything. So val means it's a value. It really, really can't change ever. And the other thing they're doing, both on these declarations and then on the methods that we're calling, so there's a put and a get, is we're also decorating those with these other mode annotations they were called. Uh, and this one says arg k, which means it's an argument. Um, and it's kind of the, the argument through K, for want of a better word. Um, argument means you can stick something in here, like a student that's mutable, because the student can change their GPA, and they can change their name, and they can change their gender assignment. But it means if I write code that depends on the student that goes in here, or the student that goes into this method here, I can't depend on any mutable state inside that student. Okay? Or to put it the other way around, the hash table can depend that if it is able, through this argument reference, to get to something like a student number or a hash code, that is fixed for the lifetime of the object that it first built on. 
Uh, and then basically we have the RI items. So basically this is saying here, this is this is a different kind of argument from that one, and this gets us the role confused, the role separation because uh, again, you know, again, the T goes in here as a K, the item goes here as an I. Okay. And you know, some of this you could do with types, but you know, we're an object-oriented lab, right? So um, nothing would stop us, for example, writing a method that returned an object. And then that object could randomly return something that was a hashable and something that's an item, because in most object oriented languages, well, in most object oriented languages, if it has a top type, you can just convert everything to the top type, and off you go, and you can get your hand out. So the catch is here we have rules, and basically the rules are look, these things aren't assignable, and something that's red can't be handed out, uh, which let us enforce uh, protection to get the invariance that we want. So there we go again, uh, rep is array, rep is just look, just looking just at the keys. Say we want to write an exposed method, which is going to hand out the array of the keys. Well, if we do this, we'll get a compiled time error. And it would say, you're not allowed to return rep. Now, one of the rules, and these are very syntactic rules, uh, says if you have something that's a rep, it's not allowed to be the return type of a method. Because you might be happy you're handing out your representation to this and not allowed to do it. Um, Okay, well, we're allowed to return things that are arg mode. So, say we make a, an arg mode, an arg a array. Anyway, look, I've made an arg a, and so what I'm going to do is rep is an array, isn't it? Yep. So, I'll expose it, I'll return it that way. Okay? It's an array, it's an array bank. Well, again, this will say, no, you can't do it. And the reason you can't do it is because it's rep and you're not allowed to assign it to arg. And similarly, maybe you want to set up this dependency if the keys, and we're doing a hash table which could change. Well, again, the system, the idea was the system would say you can't access mutable state through something that's an argument. Okay. And this, we think, isn't, would be enough to provide the protections that we wanted and to ensure we can write programs that don't have a lot of the problems that I talked about earlier on. And flexible alias protection was one of these old academic papers that had an idea, that had no implementation, that had no proof that had no theory, and would have no chance of being accepted today. But luckily, I, with John Fodder and I, found a very, very talented um, uh, PhD student, Dave Clark, and he went to work on this. And this is where the idea, or rather the formalization, formalization of the idea of ownership comes in. Because ownership that has already been around in programming before that, it was talked about uh, in object-oriented programming, particularly in C. Uh, and in C++, there's the notation that, you know, some variable, so if, if you're passing objects, and you, or you're not passing objects, you're passing things around and you pass them by copying, then you might say, well, the, the, the object that declares this variable owns the array, and when that object goes out of space, out of um, scope, sorry, the array will go away. And so, he said, look, I think we can arrange to partition our programs so that, you know, maybe we have some threads, and then these threads stack frames, and there may well be objects sitting in these stack frames. And you know, there's an object here, an object here, and then these are the things that are part of their representations. In the flexible alias protection, they would be wrapped. And you know, never the twain shall meet. Uh, and then we might have a global <coughs> heap. The stuff here is shared, and once again, you'd have similar relationships within this sort of heap. So that was where the idea of object ownership came from. And the real challenge there was how do we express it? And this is where this notion of object ownership types come from. And these days, uh, reflecting on it, I would say there's really two things that kind of go together to make up uh, an ownership system. And the first one is topology. In some sense, that's well, it's about half of what I've been talking about. This idea, for example, that there's no representation exposure, or we could generalize that and say no incoming pointers. That's a, topo a topological restriction. You aren't allowed to set things up that way. And the other half of it seems to be semantics or behavior. And we saw that on this notion of, well, there's an outgoing reference that is not allowed to read any mutable state. Okay, that's a behavioral restriction. You're allowed to have those kind of references, but there are then these semantic restrictions. And if you think about this, we want this topological restriction that every object is 
basically going to have an owner. Um, this comes back to, to ideas again that have been around computer science for a very long time. Um, we said the key idea is structured programming, right? You know, right back to Pascal and well, back to Albo, I guess. The war against the go-to. The point is, are the go-tos? Well, we got rid of go-tos by adopting structured programming and having mechanisms in our control flow that, you know, effectively tamed, that structured the control flow. The key idea in structured programming is a single entry control statement, control structures. Procedure has a single entry point. A new statement has a single entry point. You don't jump into the middle. Ownership is analogous to the single entry, single exit criteria for structured programming. Well, these days I probably deny single exit in fact. But it's analogous to that criteria for structured programming. If you're in C, well, in fact, most languages these days, you can be structured without having a single exit. You can have a return and a little bit of code. The important thing here is this single entry condition. And in some sense, what, what it turns out we are trying to do is say, let us organize the objects in our program let us structure the objects in our program in just the same way that we learned we needed to structure the control flow um, in our systems. And so basically there's a bunch of options here. Uh, the first one, which ownership types, the original day clock ownership types uh, supported, was reasonably quite restrictive. It's called owners as dominators. And you know, this had a very hard restriction because there were no incoming pointers. So if we have some object here, and that is owned B that's owned by a lot A, you can't allow to get to it except to object A. Um, mathematically, we'd say that A was an articulation point, or in fact, we then discovered the compiler people called this dominators. And in just the same way, it turns out lots of compiler optimizations and transformations depend on this notion of domination. The only way you can get to this object is through here. We're applying exactly the same notation to the object structures in the memory for exactly the same reasons. There are other ways you can configure this system. You can say, well, maybe we will relax this in some way. Maybe we will allow these two objects to have a pointer to that. And now our condition is not that there is one object, but hey, look, there's this box here. This box is the abstraction, or this box is the this box is the encapsulation boundary which we are fitting around the abstraction as tightly as we can. And okay, it just so happens that these two objects now both have to be considered as and we'll also see that, you know, you could do this with systems, for example, that work this way, where you may have an object whose own and only modifications are allowed to come down here. So this is where you have, um, uh, well, we already saw this in flex plays protection. This is a different uh, semantic restriction based on ownership. If you want to write something, you've got to go through the owners. But if you want to read it, well, you can, you can go around the side, like so. And so, in fact, uh, there's a bunch of these different different sort of semantics and restrictions. Some, like owners as dominators, are particularly restrictive, and there's a whole bunch of, of ownership systems of various kinds, particularly the early ones uh, that work that way. Um, owners as modifiers, which you can think of as, in some sense, a is advertisement because they're saying, look, um, it is possible that there is another reference in here that we may read it with. Um, again, this thing seems to work reasonably well in terms of um, in, in terms of systems to program proof rather than I don't know, memory and energy. There's various other disciplines. And at some point, you can actually have what we call purely descriptive ownership, where what you're really relying on is the topology or the topological information of the ownership system that, that you, the topological structure that you are imposing on your program. And then maybe we will use that to support other kinds of computation or other kinds of reasoning about the program. I guess the other thing is, as well as where those diagrams talk about ownership primarily in terms of the heap, um, ownership also works well in terms of the stack. So in just the same way so far I've been talking about one object nested inside another object nested inside another object, um, we can think about stack frames nested exactly the same way. If I'm, saying I'm making a nested call, I can set this up so that uh, the calling frame owns the interior frame that's been called in just the same way some object on the stack. The vector might own the array, uh, which makes up part of its extraction. And then exactly the same invariant I've talked about on the heap, no incoming pointers. Well, you basically can't have pointers that go down uh, in some sense. Uh, into stuff that has got 
uh, you know, into stuff that's encapsulated uh, down beneath you, stuff that may well be deleted because we're on a stack um, before I end up returning my stuff. So, that's the idea of ownership and the way it works. Where do these pipes come in? Well, uh, once again, I did promise people I would do some good latex. Uh, I didn't promise people I would explain it, because uh, frankly, I doubt anybody can explain this now. Um, Dave Clark originally adopted Martin Barty and Luca Cardelli's object calculus for describing uh, the semantics of the system, and there are good reasons why a couple of years later everybody adopted um, featherweight Java for doing the mathematics of their systems, because this basically just turned out to be too hard. But the important thing here is this thing in the red box. So what it says is if some object has a pointer to some other object, okay, then the object is only allowed to have that pointer if they are inside the other object's owner, or if they are that object's owner. Okay? So if I own something directly, that's fine. But if that object is owned by some object that I'm not a part of, it's not fine. If this object, well, once again, is owned by something that owns me, some, you know, by something that, you know, transitively owns me, well, yes, I'm also allowed to refer to that in this formulation. But there's no way some god object can reach down through all the encapsulation layers from the very outside of the system and do something like that at the bottom. So these days, well, things moved on, and typically the formalization of ownership types are similar to, well, all the classic generic type systems. Uh, typically, we quantify over ownership contexts rather than types. Um, if we had known at the time, we might have been able to say, well, these are phantom types. But I think the, the first papers that actually started talking about phantom types under that name came out around the same time we were doing this work. So we certainly weren't aware of it. Um, but uh, and I think this is actually an example from one of John von Aldrich's systems. Um, the point here is that we have restrictions in terms of whether, for example, we're allowed to make a method call. Okay, so this says we are trying to make some method call M on some receiver object E. And what it says is if a keyword this, and here this is being used to denote, denote um, an owner, the object is owned by the thing that's inside, if that is in the type of the method we're trying to call, then we had better be calling the method on this. Because if this, this appears in a type, it means this type denotes something that I own. Okay, and if it denotes something that I own, then I should only be able to call it directly. If somehow I've got a this type belonging to some other object, I shouldn't be able to call that method because, well, the method is saying it should only be able to be called by its owner. If I'm not the owner, if I'm not this, or if the thing that's been calling is not this, then I'm not the owner, then I shouldn't be able to call it. So these kind of rules uh, embody the various restrictions that I talked about um, to enforce these invariants that we would like. So what did the early code look like? Well, this is a fairly early one. Um, ownership types and flexible alias protection. I guess the things here is, you know, this rep has basically stayed away from the uh, flexible ownership types. This is a stack. Uh, the stack has got a link, and that link is owned by the stack. And over here, okay, we're saying uh, here's the link, and the link's got a pointer to the next, and we're giving it an owner called owner. And what that owner means is, well, this link is owned by the same thing that the other link is owned by. Uh, link next is owned by link this. Uh, and the other thing that we're doing here is we're also running these ownership parameters through. And so if you notice uh, stuff to do with data or stuff to do with the context of the links here, I've given the ownership parameter M and that is effectively the owner or the region where the things that are in this list, or sorry, in this stack in this case are going to be. We're doing the stack in terms of a list. So when we instantiate a link here or the five and pointer there, we feed M in and in the definition of the link, we're saying, well, this is the name of the owner of the data that I've got. <coughs> okay? um, it works, but obviously this is fairly heavyweight. And in some ways, um, a lot of the work, well, one area in which the work has been done, I think there's been some real success uh, in the last few years, is working out what the default should be so you don't have to write anything in here. But the reason I like putting these things in is so at this point, everything is hopefully reasonably clear what's going on. This link is owned by the class, the data in the link is M, data in the stack is M. We are binding the data, we're saying that data in the link is the same as the data. Um, an obvious way 
to deal with this problem was some adopting generics, and my colleague Alex, who's squirming in the second row, uh, worked on this. And uh, basically, the idea here is, and maybe if we understood relational parametricity, it wouldn't have come as such a surprise. But look, actually, we don't need quite as many parameters as we thought we did. In particular, um, this definition of a map has got a key which extends comparable, but now I'm saying comparable has some owner, and a value that extends object, which also has some owner, and then we're giving an owner for uh, the map itself. And if you're thinking this looks like Java, well, the answer is this does pretty much, pretty much look like Java. In fact, the syntax here is completely compatible with Java, and there are a few small tweaks that have to go in on top of the Java, Java type checker to um, enforce the ownership-specific rules that we want. So again, we can say the same thing, but you know, this now at this point we're not saying stuff that is too much worse than that generic Java. You know, here we're making this vector. We want the name to be private, but what we're saying is uh, the nodes. This is going to hold nodes apparently. We own the nodes, or this the map will own the nodes. The map will own the vector. Uh, when we make a new node, we have to say what its ownership is. And we want an iterator. Again, we're saying the iterator is going over node, over keys and values. The iterator itself, sorry, the iterator is over nodes. The nodes have a key and value that are owned by me, and then the iterator itself is over nodes. And so that is basically that was about getting on ten ten number years ago. This was roughly the state of the art in those kind of things. And there are other things that people again were working on as well. So one of them was this idea that you could use descriptive ownership for doing things. So Dave Clark, for example, had a model where what you were able to do is use the ownership system to describe the changes that were happening in the state of your program. So for example, you've got some object, we know it owns all these things, we can say there is some change under here. Okay? We have some other object, we can say these change, these, there is some change under there. And the nice thing about this is that by replying, relying on the ownership, their system was able to say, hey, look, this change and this change are completely um, separated from each other, completely discontinuous. And we know that because we know that this object owns its stuff, that object owns its stuff, and they're different. And that no role confusion Relational parametricity, I suppose we'd say, means that if those two things are configured as different, there is no way you can have something in common with both of those things. Other stuff happening around the same time, Tobias is in the front row, um, was generalizing this idea of uniqueness. So in some sense, here's classical ownership. We have a root, here's somebody, we can have references in here. We can't have incoming references, but we can have any number of references in the object start with. That list, those students can be multiple places. There'd already been work done on uniqueness, where the guarantee is, is rather thinner. It is, well, this object here is unique, but we're not saying anything about the stuff that that object points to, the stuff that that object relies on. We're talking about the incoming reference here, but nothing further. And so uh, it turns out there's a nice generalization or extension of ownership where what you actually say is, well, actually, we kind of like both. So we have the ownership structure, exactly like ownership types, and now we add in an additional constraint, saying, yeah, but this thing is also only allowed to be one, one reference here. Okay? And this then lets you do even more. So for example, if you want to move objects between one system and another, uh, you're able to do that <coughs> easily if you know that this object is externally unique. The point here is, well, you can have any structure you like in here. There can be loops. There is a loop in this diagram. All kinds of things. Double link lists, whatever you want. Any complicated B tree, interlink, butterfly list structure. And if there's only one pointer in from the outside, that's all that matters. You can even have extra pointers from the inside back to here, and it still doesn't matter because if we chop that link off, we can delete everything there. If we want to move this from one machine to another or store it on the disk, we know that's all we have to worry about. And various other people worked on graduations of this as well. So, for example, um, Jonathan Aldrich had a model which said, OK, well, sometimes, you know, this is for describing software architectures. We don't want to say, look, everything in, inside some object is just in one, in one ownership domain, one VAT. We can say, OK, maybe we want to have tellers involved. So in this object here, 
the tellers and the vaults are all directly owned by the bank, but now we've got more separation than we have. We might say, well, the tellers and vaults really have to be separated, and tellers are allowed to reference vaults, but not the other way around. Oh. Let's see, there's also been work done on um, things like this, this, which is a bit scary. This is early work done on using ownership for uh, proving programs correct. The point here is that this is actually done in a slightly different way. Um, this is a kind of this is done with an invariant, I think, for boogie. And somewhere buried in this code, there's a note that says we have an invariant that for all the nodes uh, that I might possibly talk about, the owner of that has got to be this. And presumably the data in there has got to be this. Oh, and by the way, I think that means the node is also well. So the point here is that there are ownership types, and then if you want to, if you've got more flexible techniques for doing these kind of things, uh, you can you can use them. You can do this in proof. I haven't got any slides, but there are also a number of systems that effectively again um, implement the same idea, but do it with the dynamic test technique. Uh, something fairly early on that people always used to complain about was, well, what about iterators? Um, what about iterators? If we're not allowed any coming references, we can't have an iterator and do that. Uh, because if we put the iterator inside the abstraction, um, and if we put the iterator outside the abstraction, uh, we still can't manage to get at it. And so obviously, again, the solution here, this is where you start relaxing these topological restrictions, and you say, okay, well, we have to think about this iterator um, as being at roughly the same level, in some sense, as the hash table. These two things together cooperate to be uh, the interface of the abstraction. Or at least that's one way of doing it. Uh, another way of doing it is to say, well, actually, we'll play with the semantics. So here, this is uh, universe types, which is using the JML proof system. Um, you can have iterators that can have links in here, left, right, and center. But these links are read-only links. So in terms of this invariant of the whole list, <coughs> you're sure that only link you can actually links you can actually use to change this are the ones coming from its owner, even though there may be other links in here which will let you read it. And that's another idea that we will see coming up in some of the other systems. Um, uh, Chapter before Marty Bar Barbara Liskov did an interesting ownership system. The issue here was for actually handling upgrades in persistent databases. So again, they have this same kind of problem where, well, what we want to do is be able to upgrade, change the class of an object in a persistent database. But what happens if we add a field or we take a field away? How do we know which other objects in this database are the objects that we need to also upgrade? And their answer was, well, we'll have an ownership system uh, that will let us do that. I'm sorry, I'm going to skip past the other systems. The BS has one that uh, is particularly elegant for supporting these kind of multiple entry iterators. I'm going to speed past most of this stuff. Really like me to go over this? I can if you like, but we're coming close to the end of our time, and I'm aware it's late. Hmm? I'll head on. Uh, more recently, there's been um, well, this is actually a particularly nice system again, Philip Haller, which in some ways is doing the same. I, I don't want to keep saying it's doing the same thing again, but you know, it's doing the same thing again. Um, in this case, it's doing it in Scala, and there's no extra syntax. There's almost there's, there's, there's no extra rules here. There's certainly no extra syntax here. Rather, again, it's perverting the Scala syntax in particularly nice, nice ways. So uh, this type here is a box. And a box means that, effectively, the thing inside the box, the box has got to be externally unique. Okay, so rather than saying we have to have special modifiers and stuff in the type system, they're saying we'll have a class box. And that class box is internally unique, and we will have a compiler plugin that implements the ownership rules. <coughs> um, what I particularly like is they're using these Scala implicit parameters. The implicit parameter is the parameter you have when you're not having a parameter. Uh, you never have to write it when you call the method. And basically, this implicit parameter is saying that there is something which can access, and we know that the type of that is the type of the box. So this is the thing that is basically saying this is owned and here is the owner and it's threaded through in such a way that you never actually have to write it, but of course the compiler sees it and it's there. Um, the 
stories and oh, one of the interesting ownership systems again. Um, it's almost like there's a menu of these kind of various different <coughs> options that people pick. Uh, this is an operating system done at uh, Microsoft. And so the idea here is, well, basically we have clusters which are isolated, which effectively means they're externally unique. There's only one incoming pointer into this. Uh, and the nice thing about that is, well, it's a distributed system. You can transport these things. Um, what about these things? Well, why aren't these things in the cluster? Well, actually, it's back to our old idea. Uh, well, it's in fact a stronger condition than the ARV mode from um, Alias Protection. The rule from Midori is outgoing references have to point to things that are actually hard immutable. So as long as this stuff is completely constant, you can have references to it out. That's fine because, I mean, in a distributed system, if stuff is constant, it doesn't matter whether it's on one machine or whether you've copied it across to every single one. There's no observable difference. The important thing is here, where you may well have mutable state and do all other kinds of fun things. Um, you can move things between things this one incoming externally unique pointer. A pony is another system. And so, I don't want to say in some ways it's heading back towards the uh, more noisy syntax, but so for example, it's got ISOs, isolates, which are like Midori isolates, they're what I've been calling externally unique. Uh, these are externally unique things that are also set up to be uh, transported. This vowel here is exactly the same vowel qualifier that was in alien protection. It says this thing must be a hard, really hard, immutable value. Uh, and we've got box, which is true, similar to these things, which are similar to um, that's the only one. Tobias will be happy to tell you about Encore if you missed his talk uh, on Monday, Sunday? Monday. On Monday. Um, which, well, as he says, it's make a thousand flowers bloom. Um, it's a very, Encore is really quite a flexible system, even more flexible than Pony. You can do all kinds of interesting things, and it extends these ideas to the point where you can actually describe the properties of things like log free, weight free algorithms using. These, what I suppose you can always describe as adjectives on the variables that you've got. And, but once again, I'm lurking here. There are a bunch up here that are effectively externally unique. Um, there are a bunch here. I think these are mostly to do with the log free slide. So you've got your friends read only and immutable. And OK, maybe it's a different actor. And then we've got subordinate, which is basically it's something that you own. It's the, it's the rest of it. The language that has probably done the most to bring these ideas up uh, and actually is making them practical is, of course, Rust. And we're sticking with the hash map. Here's the Rust, ru rush, but the Rust hash map. And I'm going to assert without proof that this is really not so different from the kind of stuff that I talked about that was being done in the research community. 15 years ago. So if one top of one top subtop, another subtopic of this talk could be um, how long and why it takes 15 to 20 years to get an idea that did actually start in the ECUB and the Uppsala research communities out into people's hands and in practice. And the reason is, well, you know, it's clean. This code here, I can't see anything to do with ownership. It's doing the generic ownership thing of threading, threading stuff through it here. Uh, once again, we've got an iterator. Okay, fine. We've got a table in here. In fact, it's actually doing a little bit more of that because um, uh, Rust's uh, discipline is, in some sense, a variation of the owner's modified discipline. Where the deal is, each of these variables are either going to be read-write access to something and so, or you're allowed to have multiple <coughs> read-only accesses, but you can't have both. So there's this additional assumption, again, it's a default that you can't see. And part of the trick with designing Rust and probably making these kind of systems usable, and we thought this was at the time, uh, which is to choose the right defaults. And we figured that was going to be the case at the time, but we didn't have any idea about what the best defaults would be because well, we hadn't been using these kind of systems for a long And then, here we go. Um, we've got, here you can see these little quotes there, the ownership, which are now flowing through. Um, so it's an iterator and then there's ownership going through there, which is owned myself. And um, here we are actually, again, this is a type we use to say that we're borrowing um, the particular pointer that's coming in. And that's 2016 Rust, so it's probably changed a bit. 
to wrap up, I've talked about a whole bunch of stuff. A whole bunch of systems that are similar and that are different. And one of the things, again, that we hear about in science and has been important in OPSA and EQ communities is this idea of replication. How do we know that an idea is a good one? How do we know it's replicated? You know, there was only one type system built for any of these systems. My take on replication is, in some sense, that's all this talk has been about. It's all this talk has been about. Replication doesn't mean doing something exactly the same way that it was to see if the person was lying. Okay? The point of replication fundamentally is not to catch fraudsters. That's important, but if you're a really good fraudster, you're probably going to be able to fake people anyway. The point of replication is to be able to increase our knowledge and our understanding. So the way things are actually replicated in the work that we do in software engineering and computer science is people see something, are inspired by it, think they can apply it to their own problems, make their own changes, and do it. And then they tell the rest of the world about it, either building a system or putting it out there, or if they're academics, writing a paper. And then somebody else reads that paper and thinks, I might be able to twist that idea and do it this way. Or I'll experiment with this different version of it. And so replication isn't doing the exact same thing again in a boring way. But, and I don't want to use the words least public or publishable increment. Because, I mean, the least publishable increment is a joke because, you know, the idea is you, you're always doing this about your own work. Academics or researchers will try and publish the smallest thing and then they do a little bit more next time, and a little bit more next time, and a little bit more next time. A little bit more is fine, but for real replication, you want it, that little bit more to be done by somebody else. A little bit more to be done by somebody else. And so what I'm saying is if you see something and then there's a little bit more you can do, graduate students in the room, that's worth doing. But even if, from the perspective of looking back at something 20 years later, someone like me, old and cynical, uh, instead of young and beautiful as I was at the time, um, will say, well, from my distance perspective, what's going on is replication. And the reason we can trust these ideas it's not because we managed to prove them or because I came up with them or because I'm clever, but in some sense because we intentionally or unintentionally did a half-assed job. But we did it in such a way that there was space for other people to move, and we did it in such an other way that other people could look at this idea and say, I think I can do better, or I think I can expand it in this way, and then they went off and did it. And that, I think, is actually the way we make progress. What we're doing, that, I think, is why replication is important, that, I think, is the way it actually happens in computer science. We've talked about aliasing. We started there. What happens when you have two points of one object? I've talked about this tension between abstraction and encapsulation. The abstraction being, if you like, the idea that we have, and the encapsulation is the way of putting the boundaries around that idea to keep it safe, to keep it secure, to be able to move it that we can actually support in our systems. I've talked about topology uh, and semantics as being the two main things that make up ownership systems. And I've tried to give some idea about the wide variety of stuff that people have done, both in theory and in practice, and the ways in which those axes can vary. I've talked about pointers being the go-to of data structures. And I guess I'll say, I think, yeah, but, but sort of, Pointers that go to of data structures, what is it we want to think about our programs? Do we want to think about a logic of C pointers? And if you want the logic of C pointers, the separation logic guys have got a great logic of C pointers. It's so good, you can even do pointer arithmetic and prove things about it. Well, what about a logic of Java pointers? And there are people that are working on that. Or a logic of Rust pointers. Well, we can kind of move up the levels of abstraction and say, what about a logic of encapsulated abstractions? And this is the level by which, I guess, Perhaps here and then here is the level at which ownership types and this idea of ownership is enforced by type systems or formal methods or other things, even dynamic checking, but the idea of it being enforced in the system. And then these days, uh, we're getting down to here. We're saying, well, what we are actually dealing with are no longer memory or no longer garbage collected memory or no longer garbage collected memory with attached dispatch tables. But what we're trying to build is a logic of concurrent, parallel, secure abstractions that's the way we want to think about our programs, and that's the way we want to build them. In fact, if we want the luxury of thinking about our programs to do all these kinds of things, we have to build them in this way. 
I'd like to apologize uh, to John Boylan, whom I say should always mention in these kind of talks, because I speak better with him. I'd like to apologize for all the other people whose work I couldn't fit in. If you would like to carry on and get another idea, an overview, I strongly recommend uh, this book, uh, which you don't have to buy because all your institutions um, are attached to Springer, but I believe it is on Amazon, and this covers uh, the general subject of aliasing. It's got a lot there on ownership, but it's also got all the other techniques that people have been developing, separation logic and then premise. And I'll finish um, with a little bit of philosophy. Malin Kay that the whole point of object-oriented programming is not to have to worry about what's in the object. Thank you very much for your time and patience. I've got time for questions. But I don't, well, I can yell, but the, the reason I've been pretending to be a rapper is, yeah, you pass it around or whatever. There was supposed to be another mic. Anyone have a 9 volt battery for the hotel mic? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can yell. Yeah. 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 So, what if you take the not and the two there and you, 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 know, you go into Emacs and you hit whatever meta T, right? And you switch the order of them. Is this Alan just trolling you? Is that what you're trolling me? Yeah, I mean, is, is this. Is it, is it not to have to worry about what's inside an object, or is it to not have to worry about what's inside an object? I think there's an interesting semantical difference. Uh, okay, I'm not entirely sure I see it, but then I'll get back. Yeah, I think yeah. that's right. He must have meant to not have to worry. Otherwise, what it tells you is that the whole point of object oriented programming isn't this, it's something else, but we don't know what the something else is. Oh, oh maybe, maybe that was in the next paragraph. <laughs> 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 maybe I hit maybe I hit Yeah, you're right. You're, you're right. Yeah. I mean, in some sense, this is the flip side of his more more uh, you know, more well-known statement, where he says the point of object-oriented programming is you're programming with message sends, and by message sends he means requests to an abstract interface. And if you've got requests to an abstract interface, then what you are not doing, or about which one does not have to worry, are uh, uh, the insides. Ownership is um, what, what was the question? Is it the question I'll try I could just you yell, I'll repeat the question. That was makes sense, isn't it? Yep. Um, pretend I'm in school. Yeah, Alex asked, is ownership dead and is your capabilities? And the answer is no, and I forget who it was. I think uh, Jonathan Edmonds bumped into me and said, So you're talking about ownership. It's cool again. <laughs> um, I'm not entirely sure that's true. I think the way I put this talk together and while I was yeah, maybe Alex asking me this question before didn't make you think about it, is, well, no, because ownership is this issue of the semantics and the topology. And what the capabilities, and by capabilities, I guess we mean things like, uh, where are we, we there, things like these things from Pony or those things from um, from Thor, from uh, Encore, or the ownership annotations in Rust, um, those things are the way in which people are interacting with the ownership system. But there is an ownership discipline under there, and you know, yeah, you need to do things in different forms. But the more different um, adjectives, I guess, the more different adjectives that we have to talk about our relationships with our implementations. And this point, well, I do have to worry about the object because I am, as Alan Kay, imagine yourself as being the object. I'm on the inside of the object, I'm talking about implementation. So I would say these languages are getting richer, and you know, Encore has really kind of got a union of um, an awful lot of things in here. But you know, the reason that the semantics, you know, the semantics underlying a lot of these things are based on the topological restrictions, and the topological restrictions are large. Sharp example of a complex object as wrapped component, as invariant. What's the idea? You want to enforce all accesses to that object. It 
such a way that the invariants are preserved. Yep. That means you do not want to allow independent accessing to components that would violate the integrity constraints of the object to the phone. Yes. No pointers, an abstract view, and explain the notion of uh, ownership in terms of complex objects. And the underlying abstraction is called aggregation. And all of that explained without pointers. Um, do not go for the else to the else. So the question was, sh I think, shouldn't we be using aggregation perhaps in the UML sense rather than the talk about pointers? Um, and I'm going to say the answer is both yes and no. So in some sense I agree with you, and I would say, but, but um, whether you say there is a global space of pointers or object references or object identities, um, and then we have rules that constrain the topology over that global space, or whether we actually have a richer, perhaps nested, uh, space modeling aggregation restrictions, which each have their own namespace, um, I think are two um, isomorphic views on the same thing. So I'm using pointers, I guess, partly out of habit and partly because I think it's what I'm guessing most people in the room are more familiar with. Uh, but you can see this as either, well, we're restricting pointers um, in order to provide these kind of complex object structures, or you can say, well, actually, these are the kind of things that we need to describe the properties of our object aggregations that we're building. And I think it comes out the same in the end. Functional low camel, linear, affine, various other bits and pieces. Um, and the answer is I don't I generally don't track that stuff. Um, I think these things are obviously related. Um, I, the beard is waiting to see how much you're going to be able to go, go me to saying. Um, so I'm not particularly familiar with that work. Um, they're clearly in the same space. Um, the, the functional work I'm most familiar with, perhaps possibly because it's older, is stuff like the ML region kit model. And so, um, the distinction I would make between quite a lot of the functional work and the object work is here, things can be owned by both stack frames and objects on the heap. Um, and I don't want to say this goes back to Christian Nygaard or by Steele or whoever you believe decided that objects in the heap and objects in the stack are basically the same. Uh, whereas a lot of functional work, the only things that can own anything is stack frames, but you can't have richer structures. You couldn't do the thing I was doing with the hash table and saying I want to protect against the hash table. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a feeling that the problem is, I mean, there basically seems to be no incoming pointers rule from ICFP to author and EP. <laughs> That's what I think. Is the camera still on? There seems to be a nothing coming point as well yeah, still between ICFP and, and EQ. Um, very few of the ownership papers got published there. Um, unless John or Jonathan's not in the house. I don't know of any ownership person who's ever been invited even to give this level of talk at a popular ICFP. Um, and so I'm sure there are more commonalities there. Um, I think that stuff like ownership types may in fact be, again, I don't consider myself a functional programmer. I expect these techniques are the kind of things you need to do to address these kind of things. I didn't talk about concurrent clean, but concurrent clean was an old functional language which had linear types in it, and um, I think also made a separation between pure and pure computations, and that was actually something I was aware of when I was putting uh, the first, when we were putting the first uh, batch of this stuff together. So, the specific answer is no. Uh, the general answer is, you know, I'm sure there's more that we could learn by talking to each other across those two communities. Um, where I'm standing, there is a whole bunch of stuff, and the stuff on this slide is just one piece. And I'm sure that those techniques and ideas could also be used very productively in, um, in, in the functional world. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, since you mentioned ML kit and regions and whatnot, 
um, as a means of kind of accomplishing similar things with static memory efficiency. It seems to me that ownership won and region didn't because we have Rust, but we don't have Cyclone anymore. But there were several papers that I remember reading from a while ago now about kind of the synthesis of the two. So having um, ownership over re references to regions. And it, it always seemed like a very powerful idea to me, but it doesn't seem to have gone anywhere. Do you think that there's any possibility for a renaissance of that? Or? Um, possibly I'm not aware of the work that you're thinking of. Um, so I guess, yeah, I'm not, so the question is, there's functional work which involves references to regions. How does that relate? Has regions lost as ownership one? Um, so, I mean, the brand name ownership is certainly one, and I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately sufficiently constrained to live in the real world that um, I'm going to continue using that brand name. Um, in terms of the ideas, again, I would say uh, at least the, the nested uh, stack bound regions, not so far. And then the insight was, wait a minute, actually we can generalize that. I and mean, if you go back and look at Dave's um, ownership types thesis, then it's got let region in it. And let region is one case of a much wider thing. So I don't think that you know that means that region stuff is dead. Um, if they haven't already, I think there's an interesting project in seeing what it would do to put this kind of ownership stuff into, for example, the MKIT, ML kit. I think that would seem to be an obvious thing to do. Um, I'm not going to say commutative monads, but I don't understand what they are. <laughs> but I do know enough that we've got the techniques here and the stuff that will tell you whether your monads can commute or not. Okay? Now, I can't help but if Haskell, which after all, its magnificent type system is just one small part of the Scala type system. <laughs> I can't help you if your functional language type systems aren't powerful enough to do the kind of stuff that Scala will do, or Pony will do, or Encore will do. The answer is both yes and no. Okay. So, if everything really is immutable, everything really is immutable, everything is stuck under glass, uh, fine. But, you know, do you still care about fast memory? Gee, you know, or is it immutable and we've got infinite memory? All of these things still apply, even if, well, maybe synchronization doesn't, perhaps. But, you know, do you want to save the entire world, which is what small talk used to do? Small talk used to save an entire mutable world, but you can imagine a functional language that worked in a world like small talk. Do you really want to save out the entire world? Um, even if you're in a functional language doing that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, the work that um, uh, Chandrasekhar Boyd Party and Barbara Liskov did says, well, ownership can still tell you what you need to store. Um, you can still use it for scoping. Do you want to have this distributed? How do you decide what you want to distribute? And just say, it's mutable. It doesn't matter whether it's distributed or not doesn't actually answer the, answer the engineering question, well, which bits should we actually distribute, and in what way can programmers tell systems that these things should be distributed? Um, and, you know, I, I'm willing to listen to database people and say, yeah, but those things, those decisions should be made by the VM, and perhaps they should be made by the VM. Uh, and this is why, you know, but then again, you look at Rust, people might say, well, all your memory allocation stuff should be done by the VM and a garbage collector. And there are certainly a lot of people who say, well, for whatever reason, that's not the way they want to program. They want more control over what things are doing. They want to be able to say more about the implementations of their programs. And what I'm arguing is, once you get into this issue of, if you really believe in abstraction, in particular ways, um, data abstraction or object abstraction, you need to be able to bound those abstractions. And that's what this does. Do you have any uh, 
leadership types related. Um, I, I actually, I, I have other things on my Christmas wish list, notably, <laughs> notably guitars, <laughs> amplifiers, and effects pedals, etc. Um, um, I suppose in some ways if I did have a, a, a thing on my Christmas, so, so how, how things are going to go, I don't know. I think there are, these are useful ideas. I think we've worked out the theory and increasingly the practice of these ideas quite well. And I think people are able to take these ideas into places which, you know, I might have scribbled on a paper 20 years ago. Oh, you might be able to use this for distribution. You might be able to use this for currency control. You might be able to use this for security. Um, and, you know, people actually can. Um, if there was one big thing, um, well, I think, yeah, I would be interested in having a a more effective conversation with the people in the popple and the ICMP, well, ICMP world. Frankly, I can't understand the people in the popple world, but maybe there's other people in the ICMP world. <laughs> and, you know, thinking about how those ideas... I mean, I started as a small talk programmer, um, and, you know, small talk programmers had lambdas uh, way back in 1980 that normal people could use, and the, uh, you know, in small talk if, um, was completely written by a user of the program using the encoding of the church booleans, which is something that is still a dream, a dream in the eye of the people designing Haskell Prime. <laughs> so, you know, I don't basically want to say, well, I'm the guitarist claiming that, you know, maybe what I do, you know, maybe what I do is worth playing Carnegie Hall, but um, In many, in many ways, my original motivation for the work, I was aware of stuff about functional programming, I was aware about logic logic programming, and these questions of how you manage mutable state and structure of your programs and what abstractions really are and how you make programs that are flexible with regard to abstraction, in many ways, they sit right in the middle. Just kind of a small talk around the Small talk will make that, make that small talk. Alex was saying I started with small talk programs, but actually I started with basic and then Pascal. So uh, small talk programmers have types, they just don't write them in their programs. There are advantages to doing that, there are disadvantages. They do write them in their programs, but they're called variable names. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, well, once again, thank you all for your time and patience. I'm around and <laughs>